And turning now to the United States, where a group of Texas state Democrats have come to Washington, D.C. to battle a restrictive new voting law, the Republican-backed bills disproportionately obstruct voting access amongst ethnic minorities. One of those Texas Democrats is the state representative, James Tallarico, and he's joining Michelle Martin to explain what needs to be done to protect national voting rights. Thanks, Christian. Representative Tallarico, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thanks for having me. First thing I want to know is what do you say? What do you consider the most egregious aspects of the bill that Texas is trying to pass? Yeah, there are so many troubling parts to this voter suppression bill. It reduces early voting hours. Uh, it makes it harder to distribute mail-in ballot applications. Uh, it uh, gets rid of things like drive-through voting, which which are really helpful for working families. You know, when you got a lot of kids, it's hard to herd them all into the polling location quietly. You know, it's easier to just keep them in the back of the minivan and you just drive through uh, and vote vote that way. Um, but probably the most troubling to, to me is the part of the bill that empowers partisan poll watchers, untrained partisan poll watchers, to intimidate voters at the polling place. Um, you know, I, I represent a district in Williamson County, Texas, where I grew up. And I, I my, some of my constituents are my family members, including um, my, my mama. Uh, and I can't imagine her going to vote at her polling place, exercising her constitutional rights and having a proud boy breathing down her neck as she does so. Um, that, that This is obviously political, but it's also very personal. Um, and I think we all want our grandparents, our parents, our kids to be able to have the freedom to vote in the state of Texas um, and be able to vote without fear of intimidation. Well, why do you say that though? I mean, why couldn't it go the other way? I mean, there was this famous case, you know, years ago where in Philadelphia, that was a big sort of cause with the right wing media where these members of the new Black Panther Party, two, you know, with their hats and some outfits were at a majority black poll in Philadelphia and said that they were providing security. And some white people from outside of the district were sort of driving around, not sure why, and found the presence of these people intimidating, even though that wasn't even their polling place. And of course, it became a big case and they sued and therefore these two individuals were prosecuted and there we go. So I guess what I'm wondering is why couldn't it be the other way that people of uh, the new Black Panther Party could sort of decide that they're going to descend on, you know, wherever and do the same thing? How do you know it's directed toward people of color? Yeah, this this bill would open it up to any partisan actor to come in and disrupt the the operations of a polling place, which should be disturbing to everyone, Democrats, independents, and Republicans. You know, the only reason that I bring up the fear about the Proud Boys is because I haven't seen uh, the Black Panthers storm the U.S. Capitol, um, and I haven't seen them question the legitimacy of the last election. And so what I worry about is, given the current climate, um, what type of people are going to be attracted to this, this role of being a poll watcher? Um, because we, I think we need to be very honest that, that there is no, um, you know, we don't want to paint a false equivalency. One side of the political aisle has questioned the legitimacy of American elections, and one side hasn't. Uh, and so we've got to be very honest and clear-eyed about that fact. But, we, but one of the reasons I'm curious about this is I'm just curious about why you see it so differently from your Republican colleagues. I mean, if they're going to change the rules, why do they assume that these will redound to their benefit? You know, so I should say that the opposition to this bill has been bipartisan. Um, so some Republicans do believe that this is undemocratic and un-American. Um, one of my Republican colleagues in the state house joined us in voting against this bill the first time around back in the spring. Um, and his argument was really interesting. He said that in the 2020 election, we saw historic voter turnout in the state of Texas and Republicans did quite well. Um, they won at all levels of the ballot, up and down the ballot. Um, we have to convince our Republican friends and colleagues to believe in democracy again. Um, unfortunately, the modern Republican Party has become a minoritarian party. They don't feel that they can or need to create a majority governing coalition. And, you know, they've, they've lost the last um, seven, or they've lost seven of the last eight popular votes in this country, which is a, a troubling statistic for them. So we've got to we've got to have both political parties invested in the democratic system if this is going to survive for future generations. Well, you really, you know, of course, the governor Greg Abbott says that if you return to Texas or whenever you do, he will arrest all of you. He also implies that this is kind of a junket, like a fun junket you all are on that you're, you know, on private planes and hanging out in Washington hotels and essentially shirking 
your duties. What would you say to that? You know, this is anything but fun. Um, we, we have left behind everything we love back in Texas. And many of my colleagues, uh, especially those who are over the age of 65 and, or those that have pre-existing -condition, pre conditions, um, are risking their health by, by traveling in the middle of this active pandemic. Um, I have colleagues of mine who are quarantining in their hotel rooms right now because they've been exposed to the virus. Um, but all of that is worth it because this is bigger than any individual legislator. It's bigger than any individual American. This is, this is about whether or not our precious democracy will survive. You know, we just celebrated America's birthday. And, and if we expect this uh, American experiment to survive for another 245 years, um, then we've got to stand up now. Um, democracies around the world uh, die slowly. It's not something that happens overnight. You can't point to a particular date and time when, when the democracy withered on the vine. Um, it just happens over time when journalists and when, when elected officials refuse to stand up for democratic values. And I, I refuse to let that happen in my beloved home state of Texas um, or in this country that we all share. Initially, I think the, the move that the Texas Democrats made sort of to break quorum, to come to DC and make the commitment to wait it out, even facing you know arrest and sort of ridicule in the state, uh, got a lot of attention. But now a lot of the political writers are are saying, you know, well, what else you got? You know, that really all you have is headlines. And, and what do you say to that? That there really is no strategic way forward here. And when you look at the numbers, you can kind of see the point. I mean, the reality of it is in Texas, you know, Republicans, control 18 seats in the state Senate, Democrats only 13. They control 83 seats in the House, Democrats only 67. And structurally, that's true around the country. Republicans control far more state legislatures than Democrats do. And that's been a long-term project of theirs. So what do you say to people who say, you know what, you lost that war long ago? So I'd say a couple of things. One is, you know, um, you have a, a little old state rep from Texas on your show talking about voting rights. So I think in some ways we've already won by focusing the national attention, the national conversation on the issue of, of democracy and on the issue of voting rights. So that's one. Two, the reason that we're in Washington, D.C. right now and not in New Mexico or Oklahoma or Louisiana, which would be, as you know, much more convenient for all of us in Texas. The reason we're in our national capital is because we are begging, pleading, imploring our federal counterparts to take uh, federal action to protect voting rights. That's the only way we can stop uh, Republican held legislatures around the country from undermining the sacred right to vote. Uh, and last, you know, we, we heard this week from the daughter of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. We heard from Dolores Huerta, um, the civil rights icon, both reminded us that um, although journalists are sometimes focused on who's winning the day or who's winning the week, that this struggle is a lot longer um, than any individual news cycle. Um, so we may not win each individual day, we may not win each individual week, but the hope is that we're bending that, that arc of the moral universe towards justice. Um, and that's, that's bigger than any one of us, and it's bigger than any, anyone's career. Um, it's about this American experiment and whether it will survive for generations to come. Well, there are one or two of you in, in, in Washington, Democrats, I mean by that, who do have a, a sort of an outside uh, or bigger than usual voice in this, and that's Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Cinema of Arizona. And these are and, and the, the structural problem that we spoke of earlier extends to the United States Senate, where it's a 50-50 Senate, with the vice president being a Democrat, obviously Kamala Harris being in a position to break the tie. But that only works if the Democrats are willing to forego the filibuster, you know, a Senate rule, which makes it easier for the minority or the even or there are equivalent at this point right. to block legislation. They could do that. But these two Democrats are saying that they won't do that. And I'm just wondering what kinds of conversations you've had with them. I know that you your group met with Senator yeah. Manchin sort of last week. I don't know whether you've met with Senator Sinema yet, but what what how are those conversations proceeding? You know, we left the meeting with uh, Senator Manchin feeling very optimistic that uh, a voting rights bill was possible um, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, and you know, Senator Manchin is a former Secretary of State. He knows all about election law. He cares a lot about voting rights. He reiterated that multiple times in the meeting with our delegation. And so I'm, I'm confident that we have an ally in Senator Manchin. Now, we may disagree about what tactics are necessary to get us there or, or what the bill may look like. Many of us uh, support 
you know, the full version of the For the People Act because the attack on democracy is multifaceted and it requires a comprehensive solution if we're gonna, if we're gonna save our democratic system. But my constituents in Texas are out of time. You know, they're having their sacred right to vote undermined as we speak, as I'm, as I'm talking to you right now. And so we need at least some federal voting rights action to protect the rights of my constituents, my former students, my family members back in Texas. And so I, I, am, I am very hopeful that some type of action on voting rights will pass through the U.S. Congress and will be signed by President Biden. That was one other issue I wanted to talk to you about while I have you. Um, you've gotten a lot of attention for um, a, a couple of exchanges you've had with uh, people with some different political views. Uh, one of them that kind of stood out was an exchange you had with a fellow lawmaker around uh, critical race theory or around a bill that would regulate how history can be taught in Texas schools. When you look at this side-by-side -side comparison throughout, throughout the bill, it reads like a how-to guide in historical whitewashing. Are you aware that this new version of the bill from the Senate removes the writings of Frederick Douglass? I am. Are you aware that this new version of the bill from the Senate removes the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Yes. Are you aware that this new version of the bill from the Senate removes the history of Native Americans? The way the bill is laid out, That's a yes because or no question, we are very clear are you aware that we could not be new conclusive of the bill about every single document the out there that we could, Americans. I'm, I'm going to give you an answer. You're not, this isn't a trial. But why, why would it remove those writings? What's the stated reason for taking those out? <laughs> if, you, if you could get an answer to that question, I'd be very appreciative. But I, I think what you're seeing is uh, uh, the farthest uh, fringes of the Republican base want to see a certain type of, uh, of white power preserved, um, both cultural, political, and, um, and social. And, and that's how they're attempting to do this. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's all Republicans, and I certainly don't think it's all, uh, all of my Republican colleagues, but we've got to see a little more political courage from members of the Republican Party to stand up uh, to those voices in their own coalition. One of the things about the Texas bill that stood out to me is that it would allow, it, it, would, re it would require things to be removed from the curriculum if they caused distress, if they made somebody feel uncomfortable at hearing it. And I just, as a teacher, I'm curious about yeah. how that strikes you. And so I'm thinking, gosh, if, if learning chemistry made you uncomfortable, would you <laughs> say you can't, That's or right. calculus, or algebra, or geometry, or trig, or whatever, you say, oh, that makes me uncomfortable, would you not teach that? Or, I mean, I'm just saying, as, a, as an educator, how does that strike you? How does that, how's that actually going to work? So I, I always had one rule in my classroom as a teacher, and that was to be honest with my students. Um, you know, kids kids have some of the best uh, BS detectors around, right? Um, they can tell when you're not shooting straight with them. Um, and if true learning is going to happen, if true growth is going to happen within the classroom, if you're going to cultivate a deep relationship between a teacher and a student, it has to be built on trust and it has to be built on honesty. You know, I think some of my colleagues, maybe authentically, feel that if we're honest with our kids about our history, if we're honest about the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, of our past, that students will stop loving America. That has not been my experience. Um, Ronald Reagan talked about informed patriotism. And I, I think that's what we're trying to achieve in our classrooms. We want our students to develop a true love of country, right? And, and just like in any relationship, true love means that you recognize someone for who they are, everything about them, the, the good parts and the bad parts, and you choose to love them anyway. You make a commitment. That's different from puppy love, right? When, when you were younger, when you didn't really know anything about the person, you just liked, you thought they were cute, you liked, you know, you thought they were funny, and that's about it. It's superficial. What the Republicans are trying to do with this bill is instill a puppy love of country. And I think what we have to do, especially at this moment in our history, is instill a true love of country um, from within our students. Before we let you go, you know, I'm just wondering, what do you think happened in your state? Um, you know, the a former governor, George W. Bush, later became, of course, President Bush, you know, the 43rd president of the United States, was noted for his bipartisanship. I mean, he had, you know, a cabinet of people who he, he regularly consulted with people who were Democrats. 
He was known for having good working relationships with Democrats. He was known for, as, as president, had a diverse cabinet. Um, his nominating convention was one of the most diverse in history, ethnically and racially diverse. Yeah. I'm just, you know, like, what happened here? What, what do you think happened? So something I've learned in politics is to focus less on personalities and focus more on systems. Um, you know, I think if, if former President Bush um, or former Governor Bush, that, as is the case here in Texas, uh, you know, if he were in the Republican Party today, I think you'd see him act a lot more like um, former President Trump and, and leader McConnell and others, because politicians are rational actors. We pursue what incentives are put in front of us by the systems um, in which we work. And so what you're seeing in this, in this, um, in this current political system is uh, the Democratic Party, because of our geographic distribution, right? We, we, uh, the, the Senate and the Electoral College get special preference to white rural states, um, as, as we all know, uh, which tend to be in the Republican category. Because of that basic structural fact, it forces the Democratic Party to try to appeal to as many voters as possible to build a majority coalition. You know, you saw that in President Biden and Vice President Harris in their campaign for the White House. You know, they were not just trying to, to appeal to the Democratic base, they were trying to build a coalition of progressives and, and moderates and suburban voters in order to win because the system forced the Democratic Party to do so. Because of these structural factors, the Republican Party can win an election through the Electoral College and maintain, maintain power through the Senate by appealing to a shrinking minority of white rural voters, primarily men. Um, and that's bad for democracy because that means that one party doesn't feel the need to govern uh, for the entire country. They only feel the need to govern for their shrinking minority. And that leads to bad policy outcomes, um, like we've already been discussing, the voter suppression bill, uh, and the, uh, the historical whitewashing bill in the Texas legislature. So, you know, th there's a chance that you could lose your seat as a consequence of the decision you've made. There's a chance you could get arrested. I don't know how real a possibility that is. But let's say you do lose your seat. Will it have been worth it? Absolutely. Um, I'll be able to look myself in the mirror uh, every night before I go to bed. And that's, that's worth more than any political seat you could ever have. I also know that my community members, my family members, my former students um, will be proud of me. Um, and that's, that's all you can really ask for in this life. Um, being an elected official is, is a wonderful honor. It's a wonderful privilege. But if it comes at the cost of sacrificing your own principles, your own beliefs, your own values, then it's not worth having. Um, and so I, I know what we're doing here is right. Um, I know that we are um, honoring the legacy of brave Americans from Normandy to Selma who have uh, spilled blood to sacrifice uh, and to, to stand up for the sacred right to vote. Um, and and that's, that's all you can ask for. Representative James Tallarico, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you for having me.